Um, I want to give you an update on some of the things that are going on. So if you could give me some of the uh, pictures that we have of the uh, church plant in Komiawa. For those of you who may not know, Komiawa is a very quickly, very fast growing uh, community. It is to the northwest of Tegucigalpa in Honduras. And we have a pastor there that has been working for five years. It's really a tremendous story. And if you could just, there you go now. Uh, Actually, there's Chad and myself. I don't know where, pa oh, Pastor must have been up there in the corner uh, translating for us. But this is Pastor Eddie, and Pastor Eddie left a, a, a great place. Uh, he was in San Marcos de Cologne. His children were going to a wonderful Christian school, and when the Lord put it on his heart, he pulled back on all of those blessings, and he moved his family over to Komiawa because they knew once they moved the international airport there, the whole place was going to pop. It was going to grow really fast. And so uh, this is where they've been meeting and they've got temporary shading on one side in a carport. This is no luxury suite, ladies and gentlemen. They've been in that carport for five years, more than five years. So um, anyway, that was a picture of our visit when we met Pastor Eddie. If you could put on the next one. we go right along. And this is the continued construction. Uh, for those of you that are there again are not aware to understand that the government prohibited them from turning on the electricity and turning on the water, which they have, telling them that you can have the electric in the water when the building is complete. <laughs> it's the government of Honduras. So and they are hauling this stuff in 55-gallon drums in trucks, getting the water up there so they can mix the mortar and lay the block. This is going to be a two-story structure right here. And if you could, oh, before we go, uh, you can't really see the houses or the city, but I think it shows up in the next picture. And uh, just to show you that the place is really growing, it's up on a hill, and if you could put on the next picture here, there you can see uh, the airport is actually off to your left in this picture right here. But uh, everyone will be able to see this thing. And uh, I don't know what they're going to put up there, but man, we should get some lights on this thing so everybody has to see either the cross or something in regard to the new... And of course, everybody is going to know that this is going on. And we have one more here, I believe. So that's it? Okay. Well, uh, today is very different. In terms of the offering, Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty, they were poverty-stricken people, overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. So even though they were poverty-stricken, the heart was that we know God, he'll take care of us, and we're going to help the Jewish brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of, of um, participating in the support of the saints. Shall we stand before the Lord? We don't pass a plate, but we do receive uh, financial offerings, everything going to the work of the Lord here and as you have seen today abroad. And uh, it does go into a variety of locations to bless the Lord. God has been good to us. There is a wooden box at the back and usually during the break or any other time people do deposit their sacrificial offering unto the Lord. But let's pray, okay? In the name of Jesus, we come before you with thanks for all that you have done in the past. Thank you, Lord. You have never let us down. Uh, you have been for, for us and with us in the day of battle. When we have been stricken as a church and slandered and attacked, you have been there. Uh, when we have been vandalized, you have been there. When some of our technical work was erased, you were there. And through the entire time of our existence, you were there. In the blessings, you've been there beyond our wildest imagination that this could be the sixth church that we have helped plant and build since 2020 and the beginning of COVID. When everything was shutting down, you 
almighty God, you are the one who said, you don't care. You're going forward. And if anyone would pay attention, you did take us forward. And we're glad to that. Speak to our hearts about our giving and preparing the way for the direction you send us in. In Jesus' mighty name, amen? amen. All right. I just want to welcome everybody that's watching on YouTube, and we're very glad that you have joined us today. And so we're going to be in the book of Revelation, and we're, uh, we're examining the seven letters to the seven churches. So if you want to turn to Revelation chapter 2, we'll be taking up where we left off and starting in verse 8. Title of the message today is Smyrna, the Suffering Church. And that's exactly what it was. It was the most persecuted time probably in church history. Uh, I'm sure there are others that could put up arguments, but this for sure was a bad time as far as staying alive for a long time on the earth if you're a Christian. You know, um, I was in a Christian comedy group. It was called The Special Delivery, mainly in the late 80s, and we went everywhere. Just suffice it to say that. One of the places we went to was the Chuckawalla Valley State Prison, which is a medium security uh, jail that is 20 miles out in the desert from Blythe. Now, uh, the interesting thing as far as connection is not only did the special delivery go to Chuckawalla Valley State Prison, but Charlie Butler was in that thing when we went. Now, for those of you that don't know Charlie Butler, he was a drug dealer, some biker drug dealer type. Get a picture in your head, you know, of where I'm going. He was a bad guy. And so Charlie was in the prison the three times that we went, and he avoided the special delivery, which means he avoided me giving three opportunities to come to Christ. He just, forget about it. And I'm like, wait a minute. And I didn't know him back then, but he came waltzing right in here. And Charlie would tell us about riots and how it was safer to climb the fences and throw your body over shred wire than to be stabbed up by other inmates in the Chukwuelavi. So why it's not maximum, I don't know, but it was minimum. <laughs> they called it that. Uh, we went there, and we served the Lord there in this place. Um, but I want to tell you that for all of the uh, difficulties that people had gone through in that prison, and um, it's a far cry from what Smyrna went to, I had a sound man, and uh, his wife was operating a light system for the group, and we had to set up in a great big auditorium. They had never had, ever, had an outside group come into that jail. It was just built. No one came from L.A. No one came from Phoenix. And so when our people, and there was like eight of them, saw all the guards, heard all the clanking of the locks on the gates, and felt that when you're going through the system, and now you're in this great big auditorium. Uh, I remember the, the one guy, Gary, came over to me up front, well, look, uh, you know, I, I think that what we're going to do, we're going to set the sound system over here off to the side of the stage. I said, stop, just stop. I can't help you. If something happens and these people go nuts when they come pouring in here, I won't be able to save you, Okay. Go set up in the back and trust Jesus. Don't trust Huck. And so <laughs> they did. And 250 guys came rumbling in there. And by the time it was over, they were coming up in tears, buckets, just crying their eyes out. Guys that wanted to give their life to Jesus and see a turnaround. But still, even that, even the riots, even everything that happens in that prison system is nothing compared to what the church in Smyrna experienced. And so today we're going to, if you could take that mic there, today we're going to be uh, introduced to a truly persecuted church like uh, none other. And so if you would stand with me, and so I'll begin reading. There's only four verses today, and Justin is the guy that you get to follow today. So here we go, chapter 2, verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and who has come to life says this. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. 
So do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation. Uh, This is not the great tribulation, but you still have persecution tribulation. For 10 days, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Amen. Thank you so much. So, uh, if you can, physically, let's take a knee. And if you are not able, uh, then just be seated. But we want to kneel before the Lord, our God, knowing that every knee will confess and every tongue Every knee will bow and every tongue confess, Jesus is Lord. Father, we have welcomed you. We have enjoyed worship. Our hearts hope that you enjoyed praise this morning. Answer the prayers of the people that came forward to join with a brother or a sister. And Lord, we look forward to your spirit teaching us today. I pray that every person will walk out of here and every person listening on YouTube is going to have some nugget of truth that is so personal to them that they can apply it in their lives as we continue to be conformed into the image of God's own son, Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. All right. I wanted to just do a quick refresher, and so the first overhead that we have here that we'd like to bring your attention to is the fact that these letters, which are seven, are literal, and they are spiritual, and they are historical. Uh, These churches literally existed at that time. Uh, They are spiritually relevant to you and I today. Historically, they represent a time space in church history, and you'll be seeing how that all unfolds. More specifically, in the next overhead, we see Jesus' title is, as we read, the first and the last. So, in regard to that, and our studies on Tuesdays through Isaiah, I wanted you to see two verses which clearly indicate just who the first and the last is, whether you're saying Alpha and Omega, the A to the Z, the the Aleph and the Tav, uh, the beginning and the end. So here it is. If we could show Isaiah... And we see here Isaiah 44, 6, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, that the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. There's no God besides me. So God is laying claim to that title, the first and the last. So make no mistake about that. And if we could see the next one, we'll see here Isaiah 48, 12. Listen to me, O Jacob, another name for Israel, even Israel who I called I am he, and I'm the first, I'm also the last. It's God. So when we see Jesus, who is quoting this letter to John on the island of Patmos, he refers to himself to being the first and the last. What does that tell you? Jesus is God. He is the second person of a triune God. Three persons, one God. And so just getting that out of the way that you have scriptural evidence when the cultist comes knocking on your door. You want to be equipped for those people. They need Jesus. So then we see the time period that they cover in church history is from 100 to approximately 312, 313, when Constantine then takes over. And uh, he makes Christianity a state religion. And so Things are going to happen because the government's going to embrace Christianity, uh, and they're not so good. But I want you to know this. In the face of persecution, the church thrived. The church grew, and the church grew strong. The first section on your note sheet, if if you're following, is crushed but never choked out. Um, Back where I came from in the northwest Ohio area, there was a well-known area place, store, bunch of people called Amish. And Sauter's Farm uh, was a store, restaurant, and then they had all these couple of circles of cabins or little huts that you could go to and just see things that they had made. And I'll never forget that one of the places that I went to, one of the cabins that I walked in, there was someone explaining how if you wanted to have this certain fragrance in your house, 
you had these flowers, you dried them out, and then you squeezed them. And when you crushed them, the fragrance came out. Well, that's the same thing that happens, well, first of all, to say that as Christian people, we are called to be the fragrance of Christ. We're, and we do that through our obedience and our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that fragrance of Christ is to be emitted from each one of us, myself included, into this stinky world. Because the world does stink. But we also bring that fragrance of Christ in such a way that people will want it. That is biblical for 2 Corinthians 5, I'm sorry, 2 verse 15 declares... For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So you are meant, you, wherever you live in the area you work, you're meant to be the fragrance of Christ to people around there. I want you to note the word myrrh that is inside the name Smyrna. And myrrh in that name is indicating something that the city was all about. Uh, Smyrna was located on a trade route and it linked Persia with Rome. And their main product that they produced there was myrrh. And the production of myrrh came from a gum resin that releases a fragrance when it's crushed. So just like those flowers at Sauter's Farm, the, this gum resin, when crushed, would emit this sweet, Sense and it was used for perfume in Psalm 45 8. It was used for anointing in Exodus chapter 20, verse 23, and embalming in John 19 39. And you might remember that Nicodemus came with a hundred pounds of myrrh to, we probably need to do something. He wants to preach, I, I understand. The anointing is there, we can tell. <laughs> yeah, amen. So, um, Thank you. So anyway, Nick came, Nick at night, he came and he used that myrrh to embalm the body of Jesus Christ. Now, there are two letters that receive no correction, um, and that is the letter to Philadelphia and the letter to Smyrna. These people were too busy dying, running, hiding, getting persecuted, burned at the stake, crucified, to be getting into trouble. So Jesus Christ had no rebukes or complaints against them. And so um, death is mentioned as we read these four verses three times just in their letter. And so it was a time of tremendous martyrdom. And like I said, it lasted from 60 AD till the early 300s. The first... Caesar was Nero. He was fiddling out on his balcony while he had Christians dipped in tar, strapped up on big poles and burned to be torches while he fiddled. This is the kind of thing. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that happening in Black Canyon? Can you imagine coming down Old Black Canyon Highway through town where people would be on crosses for their faith in Jesus Christ? That's what was happening there. And we can't even. We can read about it historically, but it's hard to really absorb the thing. Approximately six million people gave their lives for Jesus Christ. One of the famous people throughout church history is a guy named Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna. And so they really wanted him out of the picture. And so he was arrested, apprehended, and in his early 90s, which makes him... Uh, about the same age as John the Apostle. And for his faith in Jesus Christ, he was burned at the stake. So according to the historical tradition of the thing, they ignited the sticks below him and the flames went out. But he was then stabbed to death after that. Um, one of his quotes is that, for 80 years I have served my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ not once has he denied me, and I shall not deny him. Isn't that great? I shall not deny him. Jesus has never denied you. He's never going to deny you. And therefore, we should never deny him. Now, another interesting point about Smyrna is that 
Bible scholars believe this is where the ictus fish was developed. And some of you might say, well, what is that? Well, we're talking about the fish that you see as a Christian symbol. And so what would happen is, if you were meeting someone and maybe Jesus was talked about, you wanted to make sure that that guy or gal was really a Christian. It went around to the churches that the first person might draw with their foot the top arc. And that other person you're talking to would automatically, without being told, draw the bottom arc and make the fish. And the fish symbol being a symbol, a sign, that you actually are a Christian in that dangerous time. Also then, the Roman uh, soldiers began to identify what was going on with these fish all over the dirt. And so uh, the fish changed. And if we could have the overhead there, the ictus acronym, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior, came into being. And so that was developed, and you can see it there pretty much explained. But Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior, became an identifying symbol to the early church. And people believe that it started in Smyrna. Our text also told us that the Smyrna people lived in poverty. They were impoverished, and yet... Jesus, in his letter, calls them rich. That's amazing. So you could be someone like the woman who put, what, two mites into a container. So, and Jesus said she gave all that she had. She gave more than all the rest of these guys. So, you know, the Pharisees, they're pretty famous for maybe getting a big bag of Nickels, dimes, and quarters. Okay, it would have been shekels. And then just pouring it so that it makes a lot of noise as it goes into the coffer. The opposite is seen in a fellow named Jack Whitaker Jr. Jack won a $315 million lottery. You can find all these horror stories about lotteries throughout. Just, you know, get on the computer, just dial it in. People that lost their money, people that went bankrupt. Jack Whitaker went bankrupt in four years. And he said, his quote is, I wish I would have torn the ticket up. Because he gave his life to prostitutes, gambling, and alcohol. His wife left him, and his daughter, and then his granddaughter who ended up with a boyfriend, all died from drug overdoses, which they got their hands on through his money. Anyway, the story goes on and on with stolen cars, expensive cars everywhere. And in four years, he had nothing left. Here's what the Bible has to say to you and I. This will give you the perspective that we need as Christians living at a time like this. Romans 2.4 or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? The kindness of God it is not just so that people, saved or even lost, can say, God is good, God is kind. It's to have the production of a behavior in our life. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. There should be things in my life when I begin to discover by God's help how good God is. I'm a dirtbag saved by grace. I should be in hell, all right? But by God's grace, I'm not. And then beyond that, he makes me a pastor, seriously. And so you see there that God gives us grace and mercy so that there will be a production of a Christ-like image in our character. And it's a lifelong process. You might say, well, there's still some things that I was doing that I did a long time ago that are not pleasing to the Lord. Well, he's not done with you, okay? But be the kind of a person that considers the sufferings of Christ, the resurrection after that crucifixion. And then he gives you freely as a gift this eternal life that, that a person who's a believer has. Romans 9.3 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Like you got to see angels scratching their heads with their feathers, trying to figure out why God is so good to sinful human beings. You got to be kidding me. But yet, he is. In Ephesians 1, 7, 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And God freely gives us that undeserved favor every day of our lives when we wake up and we're still breathing, when we can open our eyes. Yeah, there's a thing called arthritis. Yes, there's all sorts of other pains that we have. And, you know, hey, nobody wants to grow older. And then there's injuries that don't heal, right? How many of them, I mean, you got those, anybody? Injuries that they're not going to heal. They're there. Man, I got two of them. And uh, hate it. But you know what? You should see the new model I'm getting. So fresh off the showroom floor. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 18, I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. See, God wants people to wake up and see the benefits so that you will know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We're rich. God says so. And it's all going to pan out when you see him eye to eye. Ephesians 3, 8, to me, the very least of all saints, Paul wrote, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. And you can always go to Christ and ask him for financial benefits when you have need. And there's probably a lot of testimonies of people here that when you were down and out, the check came through. Somebody gave you something. Somebody came up to you and just said, you know, God told me to give you this. And it works the other way around, too. You can be on the giving end of that. I'll never forget. I only saw this. Well, I did see it two times. There was a guy in the middle of summer. And he was in Mesa, and he was a homeless dude. And it's, as hot as it was, like 112, and he's all bundled up, and he's got his shopping cart, and he's got a hood up. And the hood is so big that all I could see was two little reflections of eyeballs. That's all I could see. I get done lettering a tow truck out there. And I turned the corner and I saw this guy. And the Holy Spirit said, give that guy $100. I'm like, okay, that was me. <laughs> that, was, that was my super ego. I think I had more money than I had. And so it was not. I kept driving and I thought, that can't be. And I turned the corner. I was right by the freeway. I got on the freeway and now I'm going, I'm going uh, west. I'm heading home. And it's bugging me. It's like, I can't stand it. And I get off the freeway at the next exit. I loop around. I do the big round-the-block thing. And I'm heading there, and I pull in a parking lot. And I go, God, was that me or was that you? <laughs> and I had just been paid. You know, a tow truck could be three, $400 back then. And so I thought, it's God. It is the Lord. So I went over where this guy was still sitting there on a bus bench. And I pulled over into a parking lot, and I couldn't believe it. I reached and took out one of those $100 bills, and I walked over to him. And I said, hey. <laughs> he looks at me, and I said, Jesus Christ told me to drive all around the block and tell you that I'm supposed to give you this $100 bills, and it's really from Jesus Christ. So maybe you need a room or you want to go to a restaurant, whatever. And I couldn't see his face. All I saw was like two little reflective lights. That's, it was so dark in there. He's all the big hood and he's all bundled up in this hot weather. And he blinked and tears jumped out of that hood. Never did I see, except it happened in Colorado to a guy that was going to pass away. He received Christ and tears jumped off his eyes. They didn't trickle down his face. Sometimes God wants us to be on the giving end. But then there's times where he'll bring someone into your life when you can be on the receiving end also. God says, regardless, you're rich. I would just trust them and act like it. <laughs> Jesus said, with me, you already have everything you need. And I love, this is one of my favorites, Second Peter chapter 1. We're looking at verse 2 just to identify Jesus where the word says, in fact, let's go ahead and read this one all together. You really need, and here's why I'm asking you to read it with me nice and loud. Because, and you're over there watching somewhere else on a computer, you read it out loud in that room. Because when you're done reading this, you have to ask yourself, you should ask yourself, do I believe this? Do I really believe it? Because we all need to truly believe it. Here we go. Grace and peace be multiplied to you 
in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. There it is. God says, I gave you everything pertaining to life and godliness. And when your time to leave this planet comes, you will go. Until then, live for Christ. Why would anyone dream of being like Jack Whitaker? Boy, if I could only win the lottery. These people that mess up their lives have no idea what they're getting into once they bought the ticket and then won. In verse 10, there was a mention of 10 days that there was going to be this persecution. Most scholars believe this to be allegorical, referring to the 10 days emperors of Rome, the 10 Caesars that were from 60 till 300, and that the way they would bring waves and waves of horrible persecution upon these Christian people. They were Nero, Domitian, Trajan, Marcus Aurelius, Septivus, Severus, Mascan, Arrhenius, Deci, Est, Valerian, Alarian, Diocletian, one of the real bad ones, Diocletian, who burned Bibles. Well, he didn't have Bibles. He burned scriptures and he burned the churches and he required that people would either worship the Caesars or the gods of Rome or they lose their life. Wouldn't that be something to live at a time like that? What if it was like that now? It's coming. It's coming. It's coming to this planet. When the beast takes over, it'll happen. There are five crowns that were mentioned in the text, and sometimes we wonder about those crowns. They are scripturally, actually there, there weren't five mentioned, it was just the crown of life. But there is the crown of life from James 1.12, the incorruptible crown of 1 Corinthians 9.25, the a crown of rejoicing. There's a lot of people that need that. And so that comes with Christ, 1 Thessalonians 2.19, crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4.8, and the crown of glory is 1 Peter 5.4. And, and if you're missing that and I'm going too fast, it'll all be on YouTube. So for those of you that think, well, I'm not really into crowns. Do I have to wear a crown in heaven? Well, you know, what is that going to be like? And what if I serve the Lord and the next thing I know there's going to be a pile of crowns? Do I have to walk around and like, you know, balance myself with my crowns? No, because the crowns are meant for casting. And so there is that time in Revelation 4.10 where we see even the 24 elders falling down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne. So your crown, hopefully, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, will be loaded with all kinds of shiny jewels, things. You can read it in 1 Corinthians 3, and then you'll cast that thing. I don't want to send an empty crown toward Christ. I want the most that can be in there. He deserves it. When I see Jesus Christ, I will, I'll tell you what, in the future, I will never see myself so small as when I look at him. I know I am now, but when I see him, oh my goodness. Can you imagine seeing him in all his glory when the apostles saw him? They, said, he, they couldn't even look at him. He was so bright on the Mount of Transfiguration. So... That's the background on the text. I have told you in the past that there are seven locations of the seven epistles that Paul wrote to. Seven locations, seven cities. The rest are the pastoral epistles, a letter to Philemon, first and second Thessalonians, first and second Corinthians. So you got seven total locations to match seven letters in Revelation, which match seven parables. And so Nehemiah, in the next section entitled Impoverished but Still Empowered, Nehemiah 8.10 8, tells us, Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. They were impoverished. They didn't have a lot. The government was against them. But the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's an issue of knowing Jesus' joy over you.
In Romans 15, 13, the Bible says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. I pray that for you guys here this morning. That sounds good to me. So that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, we're talking about the people in Smyrna being the ones who hid out in caves. You're sitting in a nice building now. There's fans, there's air conditioning, comfortable seats, right? Okay, these are the people of the catacombs. And, and they had to meet in places. Sure, they, they wanted to evangelize, and they did evangelize, but there was an issue where they just couldn't do this out in front of the Roman soldiers. They'd be shut down immediately. Yet they're empowered by the joy of Jesus Christ and joy over their joy over him, his joy over them. The matching epistle would be the letter to the Philippians. The theme of the whole letter to the Philippians is joy through suffering. That's what it's all about. If you read through the chapters in Philippians, you'll see it's all about joy through suffering. In Philippians 4 verse 12, the word of God says... I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to get along in prosperity. You see, when Paul said, I can do all things through Christ, it doesn't mean that I can run the 100-yard dash in four seconds. Only tigers do that. Cheetahs do that. Human beings will never do that. I know how to get along in humble means, like living down low in the gutter, or how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both having abundance and suffering need. See the extremes? Now, he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So it applies to living in a difficult situation as well as a cushy situation. I can do all things. I can live in poverty. I can live in prosperity. And then... We want to turn there to this one, Matthew chapter 13. The matching parable is the tares and the wheat. The tares and the wheat. There are seven parables, ironically, seven letters, seven locations of epistles, and now we have seven parables, and they line up with the letters. So in Matthew chapter 13, we see beginning in verse 24, this parable of the tares and the wheat. Now try to explain it. As we go along, I did tell you about the law of first use, that if you understand the first parable that the sower went out to sow, then you'll understand the rest of the parables unless otherwise noted. And there's a little bit that goes on regarding that in this parable, but it's all identified. Jesus presented yet another parable saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man, that man would be Jesus, who sowed good seed in his field. So it's going to be otherwise noted that the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. It's otherwise noted. Other than that, the seed is the word of God. But in this parable, he explained it. And he did that down in verse 38. The good seed in his field. The field is the world. So the man is Jesus. The good seed are the saints, the Christians, in the field, which is the world. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy, and the enemy is Satan, came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. The tares are the sons of the evil one, and the wheat, are true believers that came from the good seed. You get it? It makes sense when you take it apart and you match it. And you can do that on your own between verse 37 all the way to verse 43. Jesus explicitly explains these things. So when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident too. And so you have true believers and these weeds that look like wheat which are the sons of the evil one, come up also. This is what we were talking about earlier in our meeting today. That today there are pastors of mega churches getting exposed left and right. And what's going on with all that? 
You have wheat and you have tares. You have this weed that looks like wheat, but it isn't food at all. And that's what's happening in the church today. It says in verse 30, 27 that the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to him, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them? And he said, No, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them up, but the, gather the wheat into my barn. And so at the end, uh, that's what will happen, the great separation. Um, there is a great identifiable difference between tares and wheat, and if you could put up the picture. Uh, do we have that? There you go. Tares are on the right, wheat is on the left. Tares stand up tall and proud. Look at me, look at what I've done. It's all about me. But on your left, the wheat when mature bows. That's what real believers do. Real believers bow before God. We bow the knee, we bow our head, we lay flat on the floor, we give the glory to God. And I mean, that is really a profound illustration but that's the difference between the tares and the wheat. The tares try to choke out the truth of God's word. My brother recently uh, informed me in Pastora of a, a quite a big church now in Columbus where he lives and what they're doing now. And they are so woked out, all rainbowed to the hilt. And it's just unbelievable that they used to be a Bible teaching church. But this is the case. Let me just say this in a diplomatic way. It doesn't matter what group of churches, right? It doesn't matter what denominational or what denominational group of churches you might run with. There's woke in all of them, big time. I always encourage the church, if it's true, it's not Okay, so now we all got it. If it's true, it's not new. If it's new, it, it's not true. It's all in this book. It's already here, and this is what we need. So today, tares are filling the pulpits and the pews everywhere across the fruited plain, and bowing is one of the signs of a true, true conversion. Um, I want to move on to tested and triumphant. And so, this fellow Polycarp, an elderly man, had to do, all he had to do was to praise Caesar. That's all he had to do. He was taken before the proconsul. You can read a lot of this in Fox's Book of Martyrs. It goes through the death of all the apostles, and um, Polycarp is in there. He flat refused, unequivocally. There's no way he was going to do that. He was threatened to be thrown to wild beasts. He still said, where are they? Can we just get this over with? Uh, they, he was burned at the stake. They threatened him with being burned at the stake. And he, he there encouraged him, where is it? Can we go? And is that, what do you do with a person that has faith like that? So he would not budge from his faith in Jesus Christ. And as he said, God has never denied me. I'm never going to defy God. So you think the demons didn't try to weaken the whole Smyrna church? Sure they did. They had these Roman officials that would try to, well, they would test them and say, come on, you can, you can bow. All you have to do is bow. Just praise and go your way. But they wouldn't do it because that is something that a Christian just can't in conscience do. You can't give your loyalty to another. Even if our life is at stake, I always tell people this, and you think, maybe you're imagining, well, what would that be like? God is giving you grace to live today. Right? So live, live for Christ today. When it's your time to check out, God will give you the grace to pass away. 
He'll allow it. He'll give it to you. Remember this illustration of the little pinhole and how much damage it made? The example that I wanted to give our elders and deacon, and, and I give it to you too. Don't forget this. I cut this out and I never want to lose it because it's a reminder for me. If I give myself a little pinhole of sin, right? A little squirt, just a little leak, it'll get bigger and bigger. You get a little tiny hole in a water hose in your truck, car, you know? Let it go. It'll be a gusher. And you'll be stuck out somewhere, you know, with no help maybe. But you, you never want to just wink at your own habits. I would encourage you for the time we have left on the earth, for the time we have left at Calvary Black Canyon, we, I don't know how long we have here. We are here for the purpose of spreading the gospel in Black Canyon City to be the sweet fragrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's, that's a goal. That's part of your calling as a saved, born-again person to be the sweet fragrance of Jesus in a stinky world. And it is a stinky world. Here's how these demons work. They worked in Smyrna this way. They work in our life this way too. There's a captain of a cargo ship that uh, I came across here not long ago. And his job was to ship product from Long Beach out of the harbors down into Columbia. Right? And so in doing this, he made his shipment, got down into Colombia, and the cartel approached him. And they said, you take our drugs into California, and we'll give you $500,000. And so he rejected the offer. And then every time he would go from Long Beach down into Colombia, he was met by these guys, and they kept making the offer, only upping the ante. There was a little bit more money involved in it every time. And so finally, he goes down there, takes his load to Columbia, and these guys said, we're going to give you two million bucks. Just take our load. There will be people there at the docks. They'll unload it. No problem. And he said, let me think about it. And so he right away went and he called the DEA. He called the authorities. They set up a sting and they busted these guys. And so one of the members, one of the agents came over to this fella and he asked him, why did you wait so long? And here's what he said, very important, don't miss it. They were getting real close to my price. <laughs> they were getting really this far away. You know what Lucifer does? He'll keep playing with you till you get closer, closer, and closer. And temptation comes and it knows your price. And he'll play with you until you give in. If you just somehow rationalize, it's going to be okay if I do this. It's going to be all right. I'm saved by grace. Whatever you're thinking, I don't know. Maybe something went horrible in your life and you suffered a defeat of some kind and you say, ah, I'm just going to... Well, people do that all the time, you know. They just haul off and tie one on, get drunk, and <laughs> had a bad day. No. You, you got to be the person that looks to your Savior. I have to be the guy that looks to my Savior. As far as alcohol, I ain't touching. I'm just, I'm not here to have a, a, a discussion on liberty. I just, I know where I'm at. I want to go out with guns blazing. I don't want to just roll in haphazardly through the, the gates in the heaven, be taken to the throne. I want to be found serving the Lord, and I don't want anything in my capacity to behave in a bad way to be happening when I leave this planet, when my soul checks out, when my spirit leaves this body and goes to my Savior. I don't want any of that going on. That's you just take it for what it is. Follow the Holy Spirit in your own life. Temptation knows your price and it'll keep on knocking and it'll keep on upping the ante until like that guy, the captain of the ship, you think, you know what? I'm starting to think about it. Maybe it's worth it. Here's what I learned. Um, are there any of you that understand anything about training dogs? Any of you? You know some? You know some? Okay. Well, anyway, 
So I was looking at this just last night, and I read this article. In fact, I even pasted it on uh, my paper. You, you ever wonder how people can make a dog stay? It can sit and stay, and then you put food in front of it, and you tell it to stay, and it won't eat that food. It's a dog. Dogs inhale food. They, just, they don't even chew it. All right. Here's what the quote said. Teaching a dog to ignore food on the floor often involves training them to focus on you instead. This is known as leave it training. Okay? That dog has been trained to look at its owner, its master. We, as Christian people, the people of Smyrna had been trained by people like Polycarp, the Holy Spirit, to keep their eyes on their master not the temptations that would weaken them as a church, as Christian people at a critical time in church history. Satan came out with both gun blasting, trying every weapon he could find to take out the church in the first almost 300 years of its existence. We're going to get into it next week. The church grew. The church exploded. It kept growing and growing. But you're going to see next week with the church of Pergamum, Satan got inside the church. And that's how he started to mix it up and tear it down. It's always more dangerous when the tears are in the church and not out there. We need to have our eyes on our master. And so... The Holy Spirit, not Huck, not Pastor Huck, the Holy Spirit is the one that will speak to you. You know, if you just sit still before God, he'll speak to you in ways that will strengthen you and uplift you. And there might be something that you're thinking of right now that, you know, maybe I would be better off letting that go. Hey, God knows. He loves you. He's encouraging you. We have an encouraging Father. You know, if you were in a race or in some ball game, you would have a dad in the stands that's cheering you on. That's God. But if there's something that he brings to your attention, you just let it go. He'll help you. There might be a struggle. There's always a fight. Satan wants you back. Don't let him have you back. You know, Satan knows your price. Don't even go there. I want to close out with this illustration. How many of you know what a runaway ramp is? Okay. You start going up the road here and you go past Cordes Junction and you come to that, uh, you're going down the mountain into Camp Verde. And have you noticed the runaway ramp there? So it's just a soft pile of rocks. And so a semi-truck driver is barreling down there and he's, his brakes are out. He needs that runaway ramp because those soft rocks are going to let that truck sink and bring him to a stop before he loses control and him and his trailer and everything else goes flying off the edge of the mountain. All right? When you're coming down from Flagstaff, there's another one. I think it's even before you get to Sedona, there's a run. No, it's after Sedona. There's a runaway ramp. All right. It's to stop the accident from happening, it's to stop the death. It's to stop and halt the tragedy that, that could happen, but we want to stop that before it actually happens. Well, the issue being that some of us, I don't know, some of you out there may have lost the brakes in your brains. <laughs> and it's time to stop doing something that the Holy Spirit is saying, you know, let's, let's address this. Let's take this out of your life now because I'm trying to bless you. And you know what? Once we get that out of the way, you'll be removing a barricade and I can bless you in ways that I haven't blessed you before. And so let's just, this is what I want to do this morning. You know, I look around the flock and I see people that uh, I, I know who you are. So rather than give an opportunity to receive Christ this morning, I really feel like I just want to pray for the flock. So if you, can we stand before the Lord? Father God, I want to pray for these people and those who are watching uh, on YouTube and just say thank you. Thank you for the letters that you gave us. John, his goal in life was not to end up on the island of Patmos. It was just a prison island. It's like Alcatraz. 
But that's where you met him. And one of the most fantastic things happened when you gave him the revelation of yourself. And, and now we can read it. I want to pray for this church that if there's anybody that thought, you know, maybe I could just, this is something I need to take to the Lord and I need to take to you, oh God, and say, help me out. Let's get rid of this in my life. If you're putting that in their thought pattern, their thought life right now, then I want to pray that you empower them. Give them a vision of what you could do if you just chiseled that part of your life away. If you, if you stopped looking over there. If you took your plan and said, eh, I'm going to go with your plan, Almighty God. Whatever you say, even though I don't understand everything about your plans, I just want to walk in your way. And Father, I do pray that for them. Every one of these people have a desire. I would pray that as they seek you, that you would bring them the very best for themselves that they could never produce for themselves. And I pray, Father, that it happens while they're serving you. While they're doing what they do to serve you, I pray that whatever you're going to bestow upon them would occur. And so to you be the glory, and we pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen? Amen. And we know this also to be true, that Jesus never fails, right? Amen. So let's go ahead and end with that song. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth will pass away, but Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth will pass away, but Jesus never fails. God bless our food over there across the breezeway. We pray that you bless it uh, to the nourishment of these physical bodies and that you would also just bring the benefit and blessing as we fellowship, talk with one another, hang with one another, all because of Jesus in his name. Amen? Amen. God bless you.